Okay, so I think we are live now and I think we are recording. Uh, today is September 23rd, 2020. This is the Amherst Conservation Committee meeting. Um, so starting off with comments for me and I have none. Um, so Dave, do we have anything that you wanna add at this point? I do not tonight. I, I know you've got a really tight um, schedule and a full agenda. So unless there are any questions from the commission, I think I will pass tonight. Okay. So hearing none, Erin, would you like to kick off? Sure. Um, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so I will jump into, um, we have a land use application. Um, and Dave and I um, reviewed this earlier today and um, our recommendation would be to allow it. It's um, 10 people for a plant and tree studies walk on October 3rd. Um, it is on the Robert Frost Trail. Um, between Pratt Corner and Weathersfield Road. 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. It seems, it's like kind of a one-time deal, seems pretty, pretty benign. And this is from a organized group? So Deer Paths Nature Programs? Mm-hmm. Okay. So do they have insurance and all that sort of stuff there? Um... I don't know if they have insurance. Uh, are they charging people for this? I, I, can I jump in? I presume they are charging for this, but we could certainly check on the insurance issue. Um, it's one of those things that <clears throat> To be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm glad they did reach out to us. I think these mm -hmm. kinds of events happen in, on trails and conservation areas all over Massachusetts and people don't really check in. Um, so this was kind of one of those borderline cases where I'm glad they took the high road and checked with us. Um, it might be the type of thing if the commission is comfortable with it, you could, um, one option would be to approve it with the condition that they show us that they are uh, an insured organization for this type of event. Yeah, so we just, just want to make sure that we're not on the hook for if anything bad goes, anything mm -hmm. bad happens. I mean, I, I agree. It looks benign, looks great. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to say, yeah, this looks like the kind of thing we should be encouraging in terms of like learning about the natural spaces that we have yeah, I, I agree. I agree with Dave. Though my initial thought was how 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 courteous of them to reach out to us, mm -hmm. because um, I can just imagine this happening very easily without even our uh, acknowledgement. So, yeah, well, I will say, some years ago, and and this is one of the reasons that I encouraged members years ago of the commission to kind of institute a more formal policy, is that we found that there were groups using the trails and the conservation lands. <coughs> really you know in ways that we didn't even know were happening and mm -hmm. so it, it got a little bit out of control and, and didn't feel good when you found out about large events or weddings or fundraising events uh rubber ducky races you name it were happening all over town on conservation land and we didn't know about it until after the fact mm -hmm. so, so i agree i think this is a good thing we want to encourage people to go out and learn and teach about these these uh, natural areas but at the same time, as Brett said, if somebody gets hurt, um, we're on the hook uh, to some degree, but it would be nice to verify, of course, that they are insured. 
and most of these organizations are, but uh, I think you could approve this contingent upon uh, them um, um, demonstrating to us that they are insured. The only other thing I would add in that note to them is just, I mean, it's like the tiniest little thing, but just they mentioned, sorry, my dog is making a racket. They mentioned um, making tea and just reminding them that like gas stoves are okay, but no, no open flames, like just sending along the rules of use too might be helpful. But I really like that they specified their kind of picking plan. Yeah, and at this point, don't we also have a policy in general, Dave, about um, COVID related stuff? So might want to remind them of that as well. Yeah, Erin and I talked a little bit about that. So she could reach out to them if the commission is comfortable with the event, uh, adding the, you know, the, the, the requirement of insurance and just making sure that they're taking all precautions to be socially distanced and wear masks, et cetera, et cetera. So in <clears throat> generally speaking, I would ordinarily invite people to attend the meeting. This application came in really late. And also I'm, I'm kind of unclear myself regarding kind of the COVID policy um, because I know like when it first hit, we were kind of, you know, discouraging use uh, group meetings um, in public, particularly on town land. But um, I think we've come a long way since then. Yeah. Right. We're having baseball games and softball games now with masks. Right. I think we've come a long way in a couple of months. Okay. So I'll just, from this point forward, if somebody submits something rather than kind of being cautious of it, I'll just invite them to attend and we can just um, review it as a group with where we can ask them any of these questions. Mm -hmm. And I feel bad for asking this, but that section of the Robert Frost is actually on ConCom land? Doesn't feel like it is to me, but nothing a little because uh, it's going from Pratt's Corner. I mean, I'm just saying, if it's not in our land, we, <laughs> this is a moot point. They might have assumed that. Where in the proposal does it say which section? I, I'm having a little trouble reading. It was down below, so from Pratt's Corner to Weathersford. I don't know where Weathersford is. Yeah, Pratt's Corner is definitely Shootsbury. Um, hmm, yeah, they may be beyond. Uh, near stream on the trails between. Yeah. Uh, that that makes it easy. Yeah. <laughs> Next item. <laughs> yeah, this may be a moot point. Um, he does say somewhere in there, if you, uh, if something about recommending other sections of the trail or something like that. Um, but yeah, I, I think if this isn't on Amherst land, then they he should be in touch with the Shootsbury ConCom. Okay, well, I'll verify um, if they'll be in Amherst or Shootsbury. So, but um, do we need a vote or anything? Because I think in general, what I'm hearing, Aaron, is that we're supportive if it is on Amherst land. Uh, we just like to check on insurance, um, you know, the COVID stuff, and also what Anna was saying. Mm -hmm. yep. So do you want to vote or are we good to go? I, I would prefer just to have a vote because I think it's a little unclear where they want to be. And if you're okay with the event happening with those, con with the, with those requirements, then you could vote to to authorize it if they want to use an Amherst section. <laughs> that sounds good to me. So anybody else have any questions or comments on this? Okay, so looking for a motion then? Um, I'll make a motion. You wanna do it on? Nope, it's all you. It. All right, I uh, make the motion to grant the Deer Path Nature Programs um, mm -hmm access to conservation land um, for an event that they're having on Saturday, October 3rd, uh, assuming that this is in fact on Amherst conservation, conservation land, um, uh, a motion to approve uh, that event. A little botch, sorry, but that's yep. my motion. And do you wanna add the caveats that we said before? 
Um, caveat being that um, prior to, you know, approval, approval is conditional on um, uh, Deer Path's nature program uh, showing evidence of insurance um, covering the event itself. And practicing COVID and no open fires. Practicing COVID and no open fires. <laughs> Second. <laughs> Sorry, Laura. No, all good. Okay, uh, so I heard Anna has a second. So uh, let's go ahead and vote. Leroy? Aye. Jen? Aye. Larry? Aye. Anna? Aye. Oh man, everybody's like jumping around on my little list here. Uh, Laura? Aye. Jen, did you vote? Did everybody yes. vote? Somebody didn't vote. Um, Besides me, I for me. Larry. 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 <clears throat> Larry. Put it. I got it. Okay. I think we got everybody. Okay. My little Zoom list was like going up and down. So very confusing. Okay. Good. So we're all set with that. Um, okay. So, Aaron, did you want to move on to uh, the 710 item or is there something else you'd like to hit? Um, so. Um, we did have a, um, an item on at 710 for, uh, an informal discussion, um, for Joe Sikowski's, um, APR dual use solar project. But, um, I talked with Dave in advance of this meeting and just because of the amount of business that we have on this agenda, um, we think it would be a good idea for us to table that for a meeting or two until we have a more quiet agenda and we can really focus in on it. That sounds great. And so there's no big, you, no big rush on his end then? Um, no. And as a matter of fact, um, we think, you know, that uh, there's somebody who's representing Joe for the project and we'd like to have, maybe have him prepare a little presentation um, just to kind of um, get you guys acquainted with what they're discussing on the land. Um, Sounds great, Aaron. Yeah. Okay, so we're still about 15 minutes before 7.30. So what would you like to hit next? Um, so I will, let me see. Um, oh no. Um, most of the items on our agenda tonight are um, hearing related things that we can't discuss until the actual hearing occurs, but um, we did get a notice for um, aquatic vegetation treatment at the UMass pond. Um, and that was completed this past week. So just as a heads up about that. Um, there is a lot going on sort of behind the scenes. Um, as far as open space related things. I've been meeting with Brad and um, we're, we have a site visit in the works to look at some items. We have um, some permitting on the horizon for some uh, work on conservation lands. And um, I've been kind of working behind the scenes uh, with Dave and um, basically looking at some, some things like, Jen had mentioned at the last meeting, um, the trails map needs revision. And so um, I've been working to um, simplify that, break it out into sections of town, uh, recreate it because the old map was pretty obsolete um, and kind of bring it up to be more readable and um, also update it with because the last time it was updated was 2018. So um, bring it up to speed with our new acquisitions or any new trails that we've um, created since that time or parking areas and stuff like that. Yeah, related um, to that, Aaron, I wanna let you know that uh, in my department over at UMass, we have a GIS class every semester and they're always looking for projects. So if there are things that you think would be appropriate for undergrads, you know, gotta be careful what you give them. Um, you know, let me know and I'd be happy to facilitate that. And I'll let you know when the call comes out for the next round of proposals. Yeah, that's great. Um, we were approached by somebody who may or may not be interested in an in internship this fall. Um, I met with them and they were gonna get back to me. I haven't heard from them yet, but 
um, that's really good to know. And um, what department is that, um, Brett? Environmental conservation. And one of the people who teaches, I don't know if Forrest teaches fall or spring, but he's also in geography. Okay. Excellent. Sounds good. I don't know, Dave, did you have anything you wanted to add since we have about 10 minutes before our first hearing? Uh, filler. Usually I'm quite good at filler, but I'm, I'm, I feel a little under, un, unprepared tonight. Um, yeah, no, Aaron, I, you and I didn't get to chat about maps, but yes, I did have a, a long conversation with Mike uh, Warner, who is our um, one of our our main GIS coordinators in the IT department today, and um, yeah, I, I think Aaron has a lot of great ideas about mapping, and um, I think we're all in agreement that uh, the trail map that the town has been using for a long time, the trail and open space map, needs needs a real refresher from from top to bottom. So I, I think that's kind of in the works. Um, in about five minutes online, I realized that, you know, I was not seeing at least five acquisitions that the town has made in the last year, year and a half that are not even on the map. So yeah, there's, there's quite a bit of work to, to be done there. So um, Dave, could you, do you, do you know off the top of your head, which ones those are? I do. I sent them to Mike and Mike is going to update them with the assessor's office uh, ASAP. Oh, okay. So he will, typically the assessors have to get involved in that process just to confirm that um, they have that information as well. So okay. So that is in process as of about three o'clock this afternoon. So this is really minor piddly um, filler, but just to let you know on the CONCOM webpage, Aaron, uh, the upcoming meetings are on April 8th and April 22nd. So I'm not quite sure who updates that, but. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be updated on that page, and I don't have the um, <laughs> authority to go in and edit it. And I know um, that the last time I talked with Brianna about some of those items, they were in the process of launching um, a new new website pages for the town. So I don't know what the status of that is. That was kind of, I think, the end of last year. So I, I mean, it's been kind of a while, but I realize COVID has kind of thrown everybody. So it could just be that, um, you know, our plan to do that uh, had to get pushed aside for more urgent things. But um, I've been meaning to actually talk with Dave about that as well because um, there are definitely some other things on there that need to be um, updated forms and things um, that still have Beth's contact information so yeah why don't you reach out to Brianna and just get an update on on where we are with kind of the overall changes to the website because I think at some point it was kind of decided don't invest too much time energy in the old website because we're going to have a pretty pretty dramatic new site and and that may have been delayed so exactly yeah shout out to brianna who does a lot of that work for the it department okay no problem and if we're looking for more filler uh i just want to say thank you aaron for forwarding that video on amethyst brook um, I kind of skipped through it, but it was definitely cool to see that and lots of neat stuff in there. Um, yeah, that was really interesting. I was actually looking at um, an aerial image um, of Amethyst Brook. It was like a Esri kind of Google Earth image, and I had no idea there's there's like a huge agricultural field or something right behind Amethyst Brook, right behind the Amethyst Brook property. Yeah. It's really interesting. There's a lot going on in that area. Yeah, I think that's, is that Kellogg, Dave, or somebody? Dr. Kellogg, or I don't remember who owns that. Um, that's Dr. Hess. It's an APR piece of property. Dr. Hess is a large animal vet, and he farms uh, 
to the east of uh, Northeast Street after the Amethyst Farm, and then the next farm over is Dr. Hess. It's Hess McWilliams is the practice, because my friend is Rose McWilliams. <laughs> One of the things that I found interesting on that, on that, watching that video was that I happened to have a, or at least I gave it to my son. Now I have had a fly rod that was manufactured by the Amherst Fly Rod Corporation, and, and which no longer exists and so forth. They were talking and they were out where, where it actually, where the place was and so forth. I found that very interesting. Mm -hmm. The other thing from the video, the video was done by a friend of mine, a colleague, um, Brian Yellen at UMass. and. Uh, for those of you who watch, Brian did pose. He, he he had kind of a mystery out there. There's a there's a very well dug canal uh, mm -hmm. off the the Amethyst Brook, and yeah. I happen to live fairly near Brian and bumped into him yesterday or the day before. And we think we might have come to to a conclusion on that mystery, which is there are some ice ponds back in the woods, um, north of uh, Pelham Road. Mm -hmm. and um, adjacent to the Amethyst Brook. And, and I'm, I'm thinking the, the canal might have fed those ice ponds. So we're going to do a little more research on that. But if you're out there hiking, check out those, that canal that leads from the, from the Amethyst Brook. It's, it's pretty amazing. It's very long. It's very well mm -hmm. engineered. So uh, quite, quite uh, astounding what was done by hand back in the day. Yeah, I've seen it for Isn't years, that, I seen that it was draining something. I didn't realize that that was actually being used to feed something. So it's crazy that the hydrology works that way. Yeah, we're not sure. We, we just, uh, we're going to take a, a hard look at that. But I, I didn't know where the ice ponds were. And I've, I've walked them. I've never followed that canal the whole length to see if A, a meets B. But we're, we're going to check it out. I we have need, heard of digging canals we need a in order to float stuff. ice, too in the winter. So that could be another reason, Dave, if they were trying to get ice from the ponds back towards Amherst Center. Hmm. Hmm. Sorry, Larry, go ahead. All I was saying is we need a, we need a LIDAR study. Another or, or we could just go hike in the woods. <laughs> I think a hike is cheaper, last time I checked. And more fun. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a data geek, but I still think that the hike is more fun too, so. Okay, so we still have a couple more minutes. Uh, anybody see anything interesting lately on any of our town lands or? I'm still waiting for the big overhang on Amethyst Brook to fall down, but it hasn't yet. It's amazing, it's still staying there. There seems like there are more bridges at Elf Meadow. Was that something Brad and Tyler did recently? Not bridges, like uh, like plank um, mud crossings. They're not really stream crossings. Um, I will say, I just read a report from Brad this morning. Um, Brad, Brad and Tyler, and and we we had a couple of seasonals, two seasonals come on late given COVID, but they've been they've been getting a lot done, and yeah, they um, they have been re replanking a lot of um bog bridging yeah so, yeah bog bridging. thank you might be what you you saw we you know as you know we have this this fairly large grant with the kestrel trust to improve the robert frost trail and covid again through through a monkey wrench in that but they're trying to get as much work as they can done on that grant before the snow flies because i think we have to finish it by june 30th of 21 um so yeah, yeah they just, it was yeah it was rough out there in in march and april it was so muddy and people were still so determined to go outside that they were just ignoring it and and wrecking it and so it was really nice to i hadn't been out there in a while and i went back out and everything's bridged or, or, or planked everything is like mm -hmm. protected it looks really good it did so we have somebody from the public who has their hand up so um tara uh, you should be able to talk now if you want, and if you want to add some filler, we have a, another, just another couple of minutes and we're going to get going here. Oh, thank you. I just wanted to let the, um, let Erin know that I was here. I was, I've never done this before and I didn't see myself. So I just wanted to make sure that you all knew I was here. Thank you.
I think this is a first. <laughs> I yeah. usually I usually try to compile a lot of other business for us to talk about, but we have such an intense agenda tonight, and I figured we'd be busy talking. Okay. We can all take a really deep breath before we get into our busy agenda. All good. In general, Erin, why do we start at seven thirty? Could we start earlier if we so desired? Or I love that idea. Yeah, I mean, we could schedule hearings earlier. It's just, you know, typically for reporting purposes, just yeah. gives us a little extra time in advance to cover things before everybody's tired, but um, not something I'm opposed to for sure. Brett, is anybody representing Tofino here? Uh, at least one person is. So yeah, so why don't we get them set up? Um, so if you're here for Tofino, so Ted, I assume that you are. So I'm promoting Ted, you to a panelist. Um, so is there anybody else here for the Tofino 730 who's part of the applicant or representative of the applicant? No. Okay. Okay, so I have 730 on my clock. So uh, why don't we go ahead and get going. And so this is a continuation of Tofino Associates construction for single family housing. Um, we have a bunch of different ones, so lot one, two, five, six, seven, and eight. Um, we have different pieces that have been submitted at this point, and we always know, knew at some point we will need to separate these. These are separate um, NOI, so there's no doubt about that. Um, okay, and so Ted, would you like to start off by giving us an update about where you're at? Uh, I know that there's different progress depending on which parcel we're talking about as well. Yes, so um, lots one and two, uh, we would like to table for the moment. Um, I don't know what the term is. Aaron used the term in the last meeting about having, putting the, um, those NOIs in a state that would require when we want to address them again, that we would have to do a, a butter notification again. Um, but one and two are clearly a little bit more uh, challenging, so we need to think about those. But we are prepared to talk about five, six, seven, and eight, which um, we had Berkshire uh, design prepare plans with grading on them and with the uh, PVP, with the vernal pool buffer shown and what our proposed um, uh, buildings are. So uh, I'm prepared to talk about lots five, six, and seven, eight tonight. Okay. Thank you. And can you also just give us a quick update, Ted, about um, what work has gone on on five, six, seven, and eight since we last talked? And then we'll have Aaron go, and then uh, we'll take a look at the plans. We have done no work on five, six, seven, or eight. Oh, so, I mean, uh, um, planning work, not actual site work. Uh, well, we we're, we have the only planning work that we've done is we've had a house plan um, put onto each plan. Um, we've, uh, the, and we've shown the grading around each of the plans so that we, we can see that we can resolve the grading without, um, without needing to go beyond the 100 foot, without violating the 100 foot vernal pool buffer. You've actually just, I'm you've, not changed, sure. you've changed the where the, where the houses are on the lot. You've changed from what they were. Yeah. You know, you've yeah. moved the buildings. Yeah, we've moved the buildings. Okay. You know, the, the, the statutory front setback is 25 feet in this zone. The, the setbacks by covenant in the neighborhood front setback is 40 feet. And all of these um, houses are now between 25 and 40 feet from the front lot line. And uh, the plans indicate, each plan indicates how far the front of the house is from the front lot line. Okay, and Ted, can you also just remind us uh, I think I know the answer, but can you just remind us of how the vernal pool was treated, how you made the buffer, and how you added the, um, or, yeah, how you made the outline and how you added the buffer? So the vernal pool was identified by Kristen um, uh, McDonough from, from SWCA, 
and those um, points were were plotted and then given to um, Berkshire Design, and Mike Liu from Berkshire Design then took those vernal pool points and you, to create a buffer, you swing an arc from each of the lines. Um, and then the intersecting arcs, 100 foot arcs from those lines form the buffer. And he then superimposed that buffer, that PVP buffer um, onto the plan while leaving on the, uh, the, the BBW buffer that was already on the plan. Um, and the BBW buffer shows a 30, no disturb, the 50 building setback, and the 100 foot um, BBW wetland buffer. Okay. Thank you, Ted. Okay, so um, yeah, we have plans that we can definitely look at, but Aaron, I know you have some stuff that you'd like to add as well before we move forward. Well, um, so I guess just on lots one and two, I know. Uh, Ted, you had mentioned you'd like to um, re-notify abutters and um, republish the legal ad. Do you have some idea of how much time you might need? Just because kind of leaving an application in limbo um, is not something I am like to do, but you know, if we could kind of come up with a, a date or a approximate window of time, how long you might need, then that will help me to make sure that they're tracked. I will. Um, I don't have an answer for you at the moment. Uh, the I was instructed by the owners to um, resolve these four, and then once we see how these resolve, to get back to them, and then we'll, they'll make a decision about how they want me to proceed on the other two. Um, so I can give you an answer relatively quickly, but I'm just not prepared to give you an answer in this meeting. Okay, but we're not continuing the hearing for those two at this point. Mm -hmm. No, we're not going to continue the hearing because okay. uh, I think, can you remind me of the term that you used last time? It was, you said that they need to be suspended or I just don't remember. the. It was, I was just suggesting, cause we didn't, we were still continuing. I was just suggesting that if we, if we go up to a year on continuations that we just republish and re-notify um, abutters because I think a lot of abutters may have, and the public may have just kind of lost track of it because it's been yep. continued so many times. Uh, but, and, and, I, and we're happy to do that for one and two. Okay. Um, I just don't know exactly how the owners want to proceed, but I will, I will find out and have an answer for you, Erin, quickly and for the Conservation Commission at the next meeting. Okay, so we won't continue for now. We'll just await when republication will be if it happens. That makes sense. And me. maybe by the next meeting, you could give us an update on that or something. I'd be happy to. Okay. Okay, so just technically for tonight, Aaron, um, how, what should we do with one and two? I wouldn't do anything. I would just take no action and just have okay. Ted get back to us. And they, if we're not continuing those hearings, then we'll have to, abutters will be re-notified and a legal ad will be reposted for those and they'll basically um, will reopen the public hearing at that point for those. Okay, I didn't realize we could just do no action. Okay, great. Okay. Um, I did send the plans, the revised plans that we received to the board and to town council. Um, I just haven't had a chance to look at them because I was busy with site visits yesterday and today and meeting prep. Um, and I was trying to issue that Eversource permit, believe it or not, still trying to issue that, which got out today. Um, so I just didn't know if the commission had a chance to review the plans, um, if anybody wanted more time, but I can pull up the plans so that we can take a look at them in case, you know, anybody wants to take action. Yeah, I know I've had a chance to look at them. I think Larry said, you said you had a chance to look at them. What about other people? Are you okay moving forward or do you want more time? Silence. I mean, I'm, I can tell you I'm not really prepared to um, 
offer orders of conditions, you know, recommended conditions tonight. But if the board wants to, you know, take by the bull by the horns on that, it's totally your call. Yeah, sorry for the silence, Brett. I was just opening them up and looking to see, like, if I feel like I can digest enough um, now in, in real time or if I need more time. So um, I was looking hard. <laughs> sorry for the silence. No problem. I mean, most of them are relatively straightforward. I think the other yeah. ones are more complicated. These are, these are, look pretty clear. I hope, so I appreciate that. I mean, some of these are very far from the, um, from the vernal pool, so. Right. I'm not quite sure. What I find confusing about these plans is I thought that the vernal pool boundary started at the edge of the BVW that the vernal pool was in. I thought um, that was in our bylaw. I thought that that was c c brought up or something at one point. I think I'm the one who brought that up and I was corrected at the last meeting. I thought we looked it up in the bylaw and actually found it. So can you just reiterate, Ted, what you, I know you did this earlier, but uh, exactly how the, the boundary was, where the boundary is coming from. So somebody was out there and at one point it was just up the center of the vernal pool, but now you have a boundary around the vernal, vernal no, pool. No, Kristen McDonough, when she did the survey, she shot GPS points um, of the limits of the vernal pool. Those GPS points were then um, plotted and, and, um, and given to Berkshire Design who then put, they were the, uh, Berkshire Design did the original plan for the original um, overall development uh, notice of intent, you know, so long ago. And so they have all the data. So. He, uh, Mike Liu then plotted the vernal pool data from Kristen McDonough onto the existing plan and then added the 100 foot vernal pool buffer around the vernal pool that Kristen McDonough plotted. Does that make sense? That makes sense to me, yeah. I'm just I mean, confused I because the vernal pool looks square and yeah. the buffer looks round. Um, and we haven't really seen, I, I mean, I thought, I thought that we had figured at the last meeting that the, in the bylaw that the boundary of the vernal pool was coincident with the boundary of the BVW. But I, I mean, um, I guess I'm just confused because the vernal pool looks like it's in a square shape and I've never seen, I mean, I don't know. That, that's only because that one point, do you have, I also sent you an overall plan, Aaron, do you have that plan? I, you know, I don't think we've seen that overall plan with the vernal pool identified boundaries before. That's new for us. Yeah, I, I don't, I think I just got f a set of four plans, um, but let me. No, there, was, there was one that had the overall thing with the vernal pool on it, but I, I, I had some questions about that because, I mean, I wasn't sure that we had seen that before and whether it was actually valid. You saw it in a slight, you saw it in a slightly different form because it was included in the report that Kristen submitted with her, uh, that we submitted for uh, at the last or the prior meeting. I got the impression it was primarily the wetlands rather than just identifying the boundaries of the vernal pool. If you, if you see on this plan, if you can, zoom in a little more, you can see that the vernal pool is actually separately delineated. I've seen that and I looked at your plan, but I didn't realize we had seen that before. In a, in a slightly different form, it was included in the, in the uh, report that Kristen McDonough, that we submitted, that Kristen McDonough prepared and we submitted at a prior meeting. It was like on, it was a, there was a series of diagrams and that was one of the diagrams where she plotted the vernal pool. 
the vernal pool report, Ted? Yes. Okay. And if anybody wants to view that, that's under the current applications um, under the Conservation Commission webpage, that vernal pool report. And so, Ted or Aaron, what is, which line actually demarcates the vernal pool on here? Is that that solid purple? Yes. What's large? It is large. I mean, I've never seen a, a vernal pool be distinguished from the BVW around it like that. Like to say that only portions of that wetland are vernal pool and the other portions are not when, I, mean, what, I guess I'm wondering what, are we just saying that, that within that polygon are vernal pool characteristics and outside of that, those characteristics don't exist? Is that kind of, or maybe the, the limit of standing water, is that kind of what that boundary is defining? I, I believe Kristen described it in the, in the report how she went about determining that. The, the, the southern end of the BBW is never wet. I think it's, it was delineated and based upon plant and soils, but not the presence of water. I realize we might not want to read this whole thing. I just wanted to see if we could take a quick look at it. If anybody wants me to look at something else, please stop me. I just. Yeah, and I'm not trying to, you know, railroad this through, Aaron. I just want to see if we're ready to vote, that's cool. And if not, that's fine as well. But, but we've been dealing with this one for a while. So just to give it a go. I just want to see if her exhibits here real quick. And so what you were suggesting, Aaron, was that the vernal pool is not defined by the standing water. But I mean, I, I would assume that's what it would be. But I'm not sure. Granted, that's hard to tell different times of year. Sorry. Um, you're um, going, you're going down. It's, just, it's, a, it's a little bit lower when you're going. Uh, yeah, I think it's. There it is. There's one. You know, one of the things I notice about that, too, it says, the, the, the subscript down there says it's potential vernal pool. And I always had the question then about whether that was really the vernal pool or whether the whole wetlands was the vernal pool. I'm, I'm, I, I'm, it's not clear to me what the result was. <clears throat> yeah, and that was one of the questions I had too about how we want to demarcate that. And I think that the applicant is doing that. So, you know, I mean, they're being you know, it's being treated as a vernal pool, but it's not necessarily going to be listed as vernal pool on the plans. And so I don't know if we're comfortable with that or not. I have another concern as well about the layout and some of those, and that is that, uh, that uh, what happens when the owner comes in and builds that property in terms of his encroachment on the vernal pool boundaries? Yeah, but I mean, that's what we're, I mean, they're not going to get within 100 feet of that, though, Larry, so I'm not quite sure what the. The lot line, the lot line extends so it concludes a lot of the, of the area with inside that vernal pool boundary. What's the lot line? Are, are we going to impose that they can't go into that zone? They cannot build in there, definitely, correct. Are they, would they, you know, they could put a shed in there. That, that's, so how is that going to be defined? They want to put a shed in there, they have to do an NOI and come in front of us. Sorry, I was reading while Larry was talking. Larry, are you talking about if the app, if the individual who buys the house wants to then put in a shed or some other 
item in their backyard. Exactly. You know. Yeah. I mean, I think we would have to come up with some kind of um, monumentation or, you know, mm -hmm. something that would be a strong indicator to, um, to them. For example, in lot eight, half the, over half the property is outside of what they can get into. Right. But I mean, that's not, that happens that people can't expand onto parts of their land because they're protected by well in the Protection Act. I realize that, but I yeah. just, this is a, you know, over half the property being outside of where they could use it. That's an interesting issue. Yeah, I mean, boulders, I mean, it's definitely in my mind and that kind of takes care of that. So, I mean, they're just, they're not gonna be able to go past those lines that we demarcate. I think that if anybody wants, who lives in these houses wants to do anything beyond, within that 100 foot, vernal pool buffer, they're going to have to do what's required in the wetlands regulations, which are required that they file a request for determination of applicability if they want to do a fence or, a, or, or an outbuilding in that area. I think that if in you're allowed to do things in the buffer zone, but you just you, you have to appear before you guys and have you guys check up that, that you don't think it's going to be doing it, having it, you know, a, a negative effect. The following activities in the buffer zone are presumed not to alter a resource area, but still require a minimum of a filing of a request for determination in order for the commission to determine whether this presumption applies. Mm -hmm. uh, construction or installation of fences or structures not requiring a building permit. Uh, but but can, when we when we approve this, if we do, can we make sure that those kind of limitations are indicated on the deed so that this is actually a matter of record? I don't know if we can do it on the deed. I mean, again, that's why you know the monumentation out in the in the field is my preference because I'm not even sure a lot of landowners read their deeds. I can tell, confirm that vir virtually none do, but there there will be a recorded. Uh, um, Notice of, I mean, excuse me, an order of conditions. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, your issue is very valid, Larry. And yeah, something we definitely need to deal with. So Aaron, you're still hunting for the vernal pool definition? Um, I am because I think that's important. And I remember that we found it last time while we were in the hearing and um, The presumptions where a proposed activity involves removing filling dredging otherwise altering seasonal wetland sorry I was just trying to find it um I thought that, that it was we had defined that it was coincident if it was within a BVW that the boundaries were coincident with the BVW that it was located within but i I mean, it's hard to put your finger on it in the middle of a hearing um, to locate that. So if you have a vernal pool in the middle of a giant wetland, then the whole wetland becomes vernal pool, though, Aaron? That doesn't quite make sense to me. I'm just saying that that's what I recall being in the regulations. I'm not okay. stating whether that's... Uh, <laughs> oh, sure or not. I'm just saying I think I yeah. thought that's what I recalled the regulations yeah. saying. Um, I, I mean, from my perspective, it's difficult to say if you have a wetland system or a um, an identified wetland, unless there's a very well defined basin within the wetland, you know, that it's difficult to identify the boundaries of the vernal pool within that BVW, and that might be why that language was the way it was in the bylaw, but um, what, what boundary right now has been certified as a vernal pool? Well, I don't think it has been certified at all to in the 
literal sense. Can we take action on it if it hasn't been certified? Yeah, I mean, it's not like a vernal pool has to be certified in order for us to um, file a permit. We can assume that it's a vernal pool, whether it's certified or not. Yeah, and that so might be the, not, other, the other week. With yeah, I don't mean to put um, words into your mouth, Larry. I don't think that whether or not it's certified is a thing, because um, that's another level, but just whether or not it's demarcated on the map and listed, you know, the boundaries are approved, I think is a bigger issue. I think certified is something that the state actually has to do. Yeah, I agree on that. That that. Because the piece that I remember last time about the BVW was related to what you guys were doing, Ted, where you were just going to presume that that outer boundary was the same. I mean, that's, that's right. Yeah, I think I suggested that and I was and I think I was corrected and I'm looking at page 29 2D and it says the boundary of a seasonal wetland, which is, which is contains which is vernal pool falls under that category. Uh, uh, is the def is defined as one of the following and I Kristen um, identified the borders as being from the presence of water stained leaves, which is the third criteria criterion. Page 29. Sorry, I'm just looking because we have a whole section on it. Two D, like in Delta. That seems fairly straightforward. Not easy, but. So it sounds like it's one of those, one of the following. So it could be defined by the hydric soil on the site. If there's a, if there's a, a vernal pool you could say the limit of the vernal pool is where you're finding hydric soils. Or 100 year flood extent or the presence of flood of water stain leaves or ponding, presence of ponding. Well, once again, it's really difficult for us to confirm this. I mean, I, I went out there and took pictures with Ted um, late in the season, took a lot of pictures um, right around the time that we got the report from um, Kristen, or, you know, from Ted through Kristen. Um, but I didn't necessarily feel like we were verifying the boundary of the vernal pool at that time. Um, so I think that it's really, it's really up to the commission whether they're comfortable taking that you know, report and the extent of the vernal pool within the BVW as they've defined it based on the definition that we have here. So just to be clear, who was Kristen working for, the applicant? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so we have a fairly easy solution to this. I mean, um, I mean, if we have any doubt, I don't see why we're why don't, why we don't just do third party review yeah i mean certainly we could um it's difficult to do that in the fall um for a vernal pool habitat but 
as noted in our bylaw, there's other things like the hydric soils that could be used. Um, I mean, I think this is a pretty uh, liberal definition, so it's, I would defer to the commission on, on you know, your feeling. I, I don't really feel prepared to, to act, you know, to offer a recommendation on this tonight um, without having a little more time to review it. Yeah, but I mean, if we want to do third party, it'd be good for us. Yeah, that's easy for us to, I think, vote on tonight or move forward on. I agree with Brett. So. Um, so how are other commissioners feeling at this point? Um, I mean, so we have a couple options. One, we can definitely keep on talking through this. One, we can simply continue, so people have more time. Um, third is that we can ask for additional information. Personally, you know, a third party review seems to make perfect sense to me. But I said that too strongly. Um, third party review makes sense to me. And again, I agree. And so a third party review is going to help us decide how we interpret this boundary of a seasonal wetland. I think they would help us confirm where that boundary is. I don't know how they're going to do it, Jen. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know how we're going to do it any better, but you know, they're wetland scientists and I mean, that's what they do. Yeah. Um, so I would, even if they, uh, But they if they go out and confirm the, the border of the, the vernal pool, which, and the, you know, surrounding wetland, which is great. Don't we still have to decide like which of these ways we're going to decide the bound, like determine the boundary of the seasonal wetland slash, you know, vernal pool in this case? I think we're legally bound by what's in there. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's up to interpretation to a certain extent, but again, they're going to have, granted, Jen, you're, you have an unfair advantage. You understand this much better than the rest of us. Um, and teach us, teach us all the things. No, I mean, I, no, no. I, <laughs> yeah. I just, um, I think that a third, a third party, kind of a third, an independent opinion on the boundary of the vernal pool makes a lot of sense. I don't know how we're going to do that in the middle of a severe drought in the fall. So um, we're talking about a long delay in order to achieve that goal. And at the end of it, you know, chant, you know, there might be some discrepancies between this third party review of the vernal pool boundary and the one that we already have, but we're still going to have to decide as a commission if we're going to, how we're going to interpret this bylaw definition of a seasonal wetland. So um, I guess I would say if we do a third party review, we should also like, do our homework on, on how we want to define this. Have, have we decided that that vernal pool boundary is what we're agreeing on? Well, I'm hoping, Larry, that that's what the third party review would help us do. I agree with you. That's what I'm saying. I don't think we've, we've decided that that's really what the boundary of the vernal pool is yet. Correct. And part of that's related to what Jen is saying. We, we're having issues with the damn definition. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, our definition is very different than like the state definition. Yeah. I was just looking up the state definition and it's, it does it, it makes it a little easier for us. Mm -hmm. um, well, if you go further up on page 29 in 1C, it says vernal pools are seasonal wetlands that can find water for a minimum of two continuous spring months but lack vertebrate predators such as adult fish etc which would suggest that the vernal pool in the middle of a bbw then the, the 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 border the limit of the vernal pool doesn't automatically extend out to the edge of the bbw right and that and that it has to contain water for a minimum of two continuous spring months. 
Now, in this case, the reason that we got to the vernal pool discussion in the first place was because there was the presence of albicate species, right? So we kind of we were kind of backing into the vernal pool discussion from a different um, cause. But now that we have identified that there's a habitat here that is supporting these obligate species, what is the resource that we're trying to protect? Are we trying to protect the habitat for these obligate species, which is by the definition of the local bylaw, a vernal pool? Or are we trying to protect the vernal pool, which is a state uh, <laughs> there's also a, there's also a, a you know a, a de definition by a, a a wider authority, and that's I think that's where the, the the rub is here. Yeah, we're legally bound to enforce both of our both of those. Right. So I mean, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, please go. Yeah. I was just saying, like for example, lot six is almost entirely out of the hundred foot wetlands buffer, with the exception of grading. Both, both both five and six are that way. Well, five five is a little more in the hundred foot buffer. I was just thinking, like let's say we assumed that the oh, edge. Fun if we assumed that the edge of the BVW was the edge of the potential vernal pool, um, then that would mean house five was partially within that 100 foot boundary, but like lot six is almost entirely out with the exception of the patio. I agree. Lot seven is almost completely out with the exception of the patio. Uh, yeah. Lot eight is almost completely out with the exception of the patio and the garage and a small sliver of the house. Yeah, so even if we did a very conservative, you know, definition of the vernal pool. Right. Even if we assume then, yeah. right, then we're still talking about, you know yeah. there's the it at issue is patios for most of the properties. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. That's super, super conservative. I'm, I, I don't think that's what a vernal pool is. Yeah, that's the other thing is like, yeah, I agree, uh, Brett. <laughs> yeah, that being said, I mean, yeah, if we wanted to take a super conservative approach, we can definitely move forward with that. That'd be, it's one way to move forward. Um, but, you know, I mean, apart from that, I would, I'm leaning towards third party. And we did have that wetland boundary, that bigger boundary that was that was approved a while ago. Right, and that was continued um, mm -hmm. in the spring of 2019. That boundary was continued, I believe, for three years, the wetland boundary. Well, so should we, since these are independent, you know, individual, excuse me, NOIs, could we hold, could we try to figure out lot five? Like, I'm trying to think if, if we want to do a third party review, could we apply that to like mostly lot five? Or is there any way we can move any of these forward if we're going to hold some of them for a third party review? Because we really are talking about the spring. Right. That's that's exactly what I was kind of getting at with the. Um, yeah, I'm with you, Aaron. Yeah. yeah. Well, I would also like to, it's not that I disagree at all with you, Jen, but I would also like to get a third party person on board and just get their opinion on that as well. So, like on the definition, essentially. Yeah, is this something that they can do now? I assume they're going to say no, but it would just be good to, yeah, I would just feel a little better. So we'd have them lined up, we'd get their input now, and then they'd be able to do their stuff whenever it is they can do that. So, and just so that I'm clear, the third party would be a field based review as well, or would it mostly be reviewing the plans and the bylaw? No. That's another thing, Brett, is we could do like a review of the plans and the bylaw as the primary role of the third party review. And then if they felt that a field, a additional field verification was necessary, then we could hold it to the spring. You know, what if we put a decision point in there that gives us the option to not to decide whether we need to do a field verification or not? Can I make one other suggestion? 
please. That that in addition to reviewing the bylaw and the plan, that they also review um, Kristen's report, right, to, to see if the science that she's using to arrive at her delineation is sound. Mm -hmm. Okay, and yeah, I just want to note that um, different people in the public have raised their hand or put down their hand, and we definitely will get to you. So keep your hand up, uh, please. So, okay. Yeah, so we have a bunch of different options on the table at this point. Um, yeah, and again, each one of these is individual. Yeah. Okay, so um, obviously, we're going to keep talking, but um, is there anybody, any commissioners want to say anything more before mm -hmm. I open up to the public? Then I'll come back to the commission. Okay, so, oh. okay, Blake, you should be able to speak now. Hi, good evening, Blake Spirko, uh, 53 Concord Way. I put my hand up before you guys mentioned the third party review. We, I just wanted to remind the group we'd said in the spring when the abutters wanted a third party review, we were saying we really didn't need it at that time because they're already determining it was a vernal pool and they were going to use, you're going to use the wetland border as a vernal pool border. And this is a big ch change to us, uh, you know, listening into this that we're, we're trying to change the borders. And that's when my hand, hand went up. So I agree with let's someone who's uh, not, yes, a third party who's more independent. That's what I need to say. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Blake. And that definitely rings true in my mind, too. That's what I was trying to say before, where there was something about that wetland boundary, but we're just kind of being conservative as a way to move forward. So thank you. And so, John, um, you should be able to speak at this point as well. I'm coming in late. I was actually uh, here for a 7.40 p.m. meeting and I was having a lot of trouble getting into the Zoom bridge. I couldn't get to the town website and then eventually I did not receive any more errors and I was able to access it. So I'm late to the game, but better late than never potentially. So I wasn't sure if I would be able to have my couple of minutes maybe towards the end. Okay, so you have nothing. So you're not related to no. this talk here. Um, but to a to a separate issue. A later yeah. hearing. He's he's this seven. Oh, okay. Seven forty. Yeah. We haven't we're quite gotten there seven. yet, John. Yeah, we're still on our seven thirty. Okay. <laughs> so I'll just hang out until uh, you kind of. Yes, you please. Okay. So we will definitely get to it. So not sure when, but we will. Yeah, we do have four additional hearings after the Tofino hearings, just to kind of put in perspective. There's a lot of people that are on the call. Okay, um, and yeah, and I know that we're losing at least one commissioner at nine, so. Uh, we still have a quorum, so we're okay. As long as nobody has to uh, recuse themselves. And on this one, I know, Laura, you have to recuse. Could I make a recommendation to the board? Um, back, back when we were discussing this in the spring, I had been in touch with um, a, a colleague, uh, Art Allen. He works for Echotech in Worcester. Um, extremely experienced with vernal pools. And I feel like he would be a, an excellent peer reviewer to review the bylaw, the plans, and the report and give the commission some guidance with regard to if field um, additional field verification is necessary to further define the vernal pool boundary within the BVW. Um, I just feel like that would put a lot of people's minds at ease and also just give us a second opinion on how we're approaching this. So that sounds great to me, Aaron, with the only caveat being assuming that there is something still within the 100 foot BVW boundary. If everything is outside the 100 foot BVW boundary, I'm good. Um, but if we're, but if those boundaries start to get crossed with the new uh, lines that we're talking about, that's where, yeah, I would definitely want to. And are you talking about grading as well? Because I mean, the plans show the houses outside the 100 foot, but grading within 100 foot for, for all of them, portions of all of them. 
Yeah, and so can you remind me on, I mean, so is it a hundred foot no touch or is it a hundred foot? There's a hundred foot no disturb around vernal pools in the town of Amherst. Yeah, so I would want to be with that, so. Okay. Okay, so Ted, are any of these that you are proposing at this point, are any of them a hundred percent no touch outside the hundred foot wetland uh, BBW? Buffer no, or? They're, they're all they're all 100 foot no touch outside the vernal pool buffer as defined by Kristen. Okay, okay. In that case, yeah, I would say I would be much more comfortable moving forward with third party review as you were suggesting, Aaron. Uh, I don't have a preference on any on any individuals. I fully trust you, um, but basically a desk review. Um, I think would be very helpful in us moving forward. And they would help determine whether or not we need to do a field, um, some field work as well. So other commissioners thoughts? I would concur with that. I'd feel comfortable with the third party desk review and then possible follow up field depending. Okay. So it looks like, so our next meeting isn't until October 14th. Am I right about that? Mm -hmm. So do you think that, I don't know, if there's any shot at having, at having that result by then, by the next meeting, I think that would be really great. I mean, everyone's really busy, but. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I can definitely do my best. Um, the, the biggest, um, hold up will really be the funding. So like we'll have to set up a contract with um, a peer reviewer and in order for that peer, that contract to begin, we'd have to have funds to pay that individual. So it would really be, I'd get a quote, the applicant would provide the funds to me so I could set up the contract. And then as soon as we had that check deposited, the individual could start the work. So it's really based on like sort of the procurement process as to how fast we can move. But if we can move, if the applicant, you know, if I can get a quote before Friday and the applicant can get us a check early next week, we can try to make it go as quickly as we can. And as part of that contract, the third party will present in front of us. So Whatever just, you want, but yeah, certainly we could have that be a, um, a, a condition of the peer review. I'd prefer a written and a verbal report would be perfect. And so, yeah. Anything else that we would want as direction for our third party review? Um, I would just recommend that we make a motion and I recommend that we do that while Jen is in the room because right now we have four people on the commission who can vote on this and as soon as we lose one of them we don't have a quorum anymore on this um, item. Wait, so this predates Leroy? Yes. Oh man. It's this <laughs> been going on for a year. Leroy just started aye, aye, aye. I think in the spring, right Leroy? Yeah. Um, so the only further I'm like racking my brain for any other kind of guidelines for a peer reviewer and the only other thing is I haven't checked recently Aaron but have there been any additional state guidelines with whether or not we can even do these delineations during the drought conditions. Do you know. I haven't um, seen anything. As far as I know it's pertaining to um, overcoming the presumption of um, per, if a stream is perennial is the only. Yeah, that's what I saw too. I wasn't sure. I mean, that was maybe a month ago and it's only gotten worse. So I didn't know if they'd made any more stringent um, changes, but yeah, that's the only other thing I can think of is if it's. Well, I mean, I think a peer review this time of year would not be appropriate anyway, right? Uh, I mean, yeah, of course. If, if the peer reviewer came back and said, we need to ver field verify this boundary. Or that's waiting. my recommendation. Yeah. We would have to wait. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that shouldn't impact the desk review, though. So we should be good. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Just racking the brain. Thank you. Yeah. And so we'll ask Fletcher um, to review this, the notes from today. So I'm sure he'll love that. Uh, and then he can be fully up to speed as well.
Okay. Um, yeah, so we can, since we need to continue one, we can just continue all, all of these so that hopefully the applicant can come back to us next time for a date for the one and two. Uh, and then, or I guess, oh, we can just do no action. So I guess that doesn't really matter on that one. But um, basically we're continuing all of these till next time. So- um, Ted, so Do you have a preference on that? I'd say we just continue no. all of them. So, oh, sorry. I didn't know who you were asking. <laughs> I have no preference. Okay, so looking for a motion for continuation. Uh, I'm just gonna say for all of these um, <laughs> with the um, recommendation that we have a third party review with those, um, with those guidelines. I don't know if you wanna restate those or have uh, I can I can attempt it. Um, Aaron, what time on the on October fourteenth should I say? Oh, you're muted. Just hang one second. Um, I would suggest uh, seven forty on October fourteenth. Okay. So let's let me give this a try. I move that we continue the notice of intents for Tofino, Tofino Associates for construction of single family homes and assist with associated driveways, utilities, landscaping within buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetlands at lot one Concord Way, lot two Concord Way, lot five Concord Way, lot six Concord Way, lot seven Concord Way, and lot, lot number eight Concord Way. Um, with the condition that we um, initiate um, a peer review on um, the existing uh, vernal pool delineation and associated report and the um, town Amherst town bylaw definition of a vernal pool, especially relative to the surrounding wetlands um, and uh, guidance on how that should be interpreted in the context of um, the formerly mentioned lots on Concord Way and Amherst Mass. Um, and I move that we continue these hearings to October 14th um, at 7.40 p.m. Second, that was a champion That motion. was fantastic. <laughs> I think it was great. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> So, hey, okay. so voice vote, Larry. Oh wait, did someone? Yes. Yeah. Who seconded? Uh, Anna oh, seconded. I, 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 Anna I, seconded, seconded. I seconded, and then I went right into like gold stars for <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Okay, Anna. Yes, I. Jen. I. So I for me, and just for the record, Leroy. I. Oh no no. Uh, you can't, you have to recuse. I can, yeah. So, and then Laura, you recuse as well? That's right. Okay. Okay. Um, so, Ted, uh, I assume you and Aaron will be in communication. Um, yep. So, obviously, the sooner that we can get all of that paperwork set up, the quicker we can move forward. we Will do. Look forward to hearing from you, Aaron, and I look forward to seeing you all in the middle of October. Take care. Okay. You too. Bye-bye. And for those from the public, just remember, um, yeah, you can always check in with Aaron about how things are progressing. Um, hopefully things are done in time and we can move forward on this on the 14th. Okay, so now we are moving on to our 740. Oh wait, nope, uh, our 735, I'm sorry. Yep. Um, and this is a request for determination and I am just pulling up my uh, my script here, so one second. My little icon is still bouncing. Okay, I got it now. I thought I did. Okay, 
This public hearing is now called to order. This meeting is being held as required by provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth and Act relative to the protection of wetlands as most recently amended in the Town of Amherst Protection by law. This is, again, a request for determination um, for Tara, Tara Acker for construction of in-ground pool and patio over 50 feet from bordering vegetated wetland at 36 Weaver Circle. This project is only jurisdictional under the um, Town of Amherst Wetland Protection Bylaw. And this is map 8B, parcel 132. And for those who are here, um, if you are the applicant, so Tara, obviously you are, I will promote you to panelist. And Tara, is there anybody else here with you that should be a panelist? Hello, Tara. Hello. Okay. So, um, so if you wouldn't mind, if you want to give a introduction to the project, and uh, then we'll turn it over to Erin for some additional information. Sure. Happy to. Thank you. Um, so, I am interested in um, installing an in-ground pool in a developed backyard at Thirty-six Weaver Circle. Um, I uh, contracted Erica Cross to do a delineation per Erin's uh, guidance. Um, she did the delineation for us and showed us the 50-foot um, um, no work uh, line. And then I contracted um, a landscape architect to see what we could do in terms of utilizing the rest of the yard to do a possible in-ground pool. Um, the landscape architect did uh, a rough sketch of where we could put an in-ground pool that's approximately 75 feet from an intermittent stream. Um, away from, from the delineation that Erica Cross had uh, identified. And so I'm here tonight to see if the Conservation Commission would allow me to move forward with an in-ground pool. Um, I have four summers left with my daughter and then she's off to college. So that's my motivation. <laughs> Understood. Oh, I would also add that um, the landscape architect um, is very familiar with projects like these. I'm working with Rick Miller from RJ Miller um, construction and uh, he uh, would put in if if granted permission he would put in all the erosion controls uh, straw wattles and a silt fence um, at the line where there's no work permit uh, permitted okay sounds good Erin yes yeah, so I went out um, and did a site visit um, today so this is uh, basically coming in from the driveway um, and looking back at the driveway, this, is, this fence would come out and the contractor would be accessing through this area to come into the backyard. And then you can kind of see the steps coming up to this deck. That deck is on the left here in this picture and this, the pool is, you can not really see it, but it's, they had it staked out in the middle of the lawn here in this area. Um, where the pool would be located. They also had an area strung to um, identify where the 50 foot um, boundary was located. And um, as part of the application, there are three trees, um, this one, this one, and this one, which are, um, if you're looking at their fire pit, sort of to the far right of the fire pit. Um, so again, about 50 feet from the wetland. And then there is, um, the, this photo here in the middle is standing in the same location, but turned around um, facing the wetland. And there is one tree, one or two trees there that were um, identified as hazard trees um, that are within 50 feet that they like to take down. Um, so under the Wetland Protection Act, deck sheds, patios, and pools are exempt from the Wetland Protection Act as long as they're located over 50 feet from the mean annual high water line of an intermittent stream or bordering vegetated wetland. So the project is exempt under state law, just um, applicable under our local bylaw because we don't have that exemption under our bylaw. Um, I would recommend as far as conditions um, that erosion controls be installed at the limit of work um, 
and that there be an erosion control inspection prior to the start of work, um, an, erosion, an erosion control inspection once the site is stable prior to removing controls, and that I would have the right to monitor the site to ensure compliance. And then one additional um, condition that didn't make it on here that I would recommend is that we not allow the pool to be drained on site, that it would have, water would have to be pumped out of the pool into a truck to be taken off site. Um, other than that, I have no issues with the project and would recommend um, a positive determination, checking box B5, um, which just acknowledges that the work is jurisdictional under our local bylaw, and then a negative determination under B5, which um, defines that the project is exempt um, as a minor activity under the Wetlands Protection Act. Okay. Thank you very much, Erin. So commissioners, any thoughts? It seems fairly straightforward. Um, yeah, just one minor thing that I had was from the map that was shown, um, just to make sure that the silt fence doesn't necessarily need to go through the middle of the woods, um, but yeah, just the wherever um, the extent of the work is. So nothing. That is good. So um, going to the public, is, if anybody in the public has any comments or thoughts on this, you can use a little hand raising tool. Okay, so I am not hearing anything. So at that point, we are looking for a motion. And Aaron, again, can you prompt us on, on the specific negatives and that sort of stuff? Yeah, there we go. Yes, yep. Thank you. You want me to do it? You did so well last time, Jen. No one can compare. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. I don't think so. I think we all have, we all add something special to the questions. <laughs> Some of us are more special than others, though, Jen. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think so. Um, okay, so where are we? All right. I move that we that we make a positive determination checking box B5 and a negative determination under B5 exemption. Yeah, for the construction of an in-ground pool and patio over 50 feet from BVW at 36 Weaver Circle. Um, yeah, it's my motion. And the conditions? Oh, and the conditions, sorry, on the motion are, we got, oh, they're, oh, they're up there. Thanks, Erin. Um, that erosion controls are installed at the limits of work. Um, there's an erosion control inspection um, by the town wetland administrator prior to the start of work, um, as well as an erosion control inspection once the site is stable prior to removing the erosion controls. Um, that the wetlands administrator has the right to monitor the site to ensure compliance, and that um, if the pool needs to be emptied for some reason, that it should be pumped dry and water chucked off site rather than released on site. Thank you, Jen. Looking for a second. Second. I'm sorry, that was Larry? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so going through on a vote. So Larry? Yes. Anna? Aye. Jen? Aye. Leroy? Aye. Laura? Aye. And I from me as Anna, did we get you? Mm -hmm. Where was Anna? So Anna. I was like second. You got me. Okay. Aye, aye, aye. I'm off my game tonight. Sorry. So, okay, and I for me as well. Um, so Tara, we are in good shape here and um, Aaron will be in communications about paperwork and moving forward. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so moving on down the road. 
Um, so we are now on our 740 agenda item. And I'm just pulling up my sheet again. This public meeting is now called to order. This meeting is being held as required by the provisions of chapter 131, section 40 of the general laws of the Commonwealth and act relative to the protections of wetlands as most recently amended in the town of Amherst wetlands protection by law. This is for request for termination um, from Jonathan Anderson for placement of an eight foot by eight foot prefab shed over 50 feet from bordering vegetated wetland on existing lawn at 30 Paley Village Place, map 21B, parcel 88. This project is only jurisdictional under town of Amherst Wetland Protection Bylaw and Regulations. And so, John, I am, you should be able to um, speak at this point, John, and if you would introduce yourself and give us a little introduction to the project, that'd be much appreciated. I can go, I'm going to. I think we're playing the mute unmute game here. Yeah, John, you're muted at this point. There we go. Can you hear there me now? We go. Okay. So thanks for hearing me this evening. Um, my name is Jonathan Anderson. I recently moved back to Amherst with my wife and two kids. Um, towards the middle of the summer, I have a snowblower and you know, a lawnmower and that kind of stuff. And my wife was looking, hoping that I could get some stuff out of the garage to make more room for the kids and their stuff, so on and so forth. So I reached out to the building department, uh, the Amherst building department to see if there were any laws that I should be aware of, permits that were necessary, uh, found that there were not. Went ahead and ordered the shed, the prefab shed that you had laid out um, earlier on in your kind of introduction to today's meeting or this evening's meeting with myself. Um, shortly thereafter, I don't remember his name off the top of my head, but the building inspector had uh, emailed me back and said, hey, I think maybe you should talk to Aaron Jock in the wetlands uh, department or with the wetlands commission uh, with regards to seeing if even though you're exempt from state law to have the dimensions for which the shed that you want to you know put in place there might be some town bylaws or ordinance or whatnot that you need to adhere to um, the shed was already purchased at that point but Erin was you know obviously quite knowledgeable she worked with me very closely to make sure that i was outside of that 50 foot buffer um, from the wetlands and in addition, I hadn't disturbed any earth. There's nothing that would, um, you know, kind of seep into the, you know, uh, into, into the ground or whatnot, no concrete sauna tubes or anything like that. So uh, that's about it. I'm just looking to see if I can get approval for the shed, even though it's kind of a little backwards in the process. But again, Aaron can probably shed some light on that as well. Better late than never. So uh, that's what I think. Erin? Yeah, so I mean, I think John's accounting is pretty accurate. Um, I got the call, let him know that it is exempt under state law because he's over 50 feet away, but it's not exempt under our local bylaw and that he would need to get approval from the Conservation Commission through a request for determination. Um, you know, I've been working with John to get through this process. Um, and luckily he had a survey and a delineation already for his property. So um, that piece was, was already done. Um, there was no ground disturbance, no excavation. He's putting it on existing lawn. He put down some pea stone and as you can see, some cinder blocks and it was constructed on top of that. So I went out today, there wasn't even any disturbance to the lawn as part of the construction. So the site's fully stable and at this point, um, I don't even have any conditions for the permit because everything has basically been constructed already and the site is stable. Um, I would basically just recommend that the commission issue a positive determination checking box B5 um, to acknowledge the jurisdiction under the local bylaw and a negative determination under B5 stating the exemption um, that the work is exempt under the Wetlands Protection Act. Fantastic. 
So commissioners, thoughts, ideas on this one? Even more straightforward. Mm -hmm. It seems uh, very clear. So I'll just open up to the public real quick. If there's anybody from the public who'd like to comment on this one. Okay. So not hearing anything from the public, nothing from any additional commissioners looking for a motion. I'm just so scared to do it wrong. All right. I'll jump in. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm happy, it's gonna happen. All right. Um, I motion to find a positive determination checking box B5. Um, indicating that the work is jurisdictional under the local wetlands bylaw and a negative determination under the B5 exemption that the work is in an exempt minor activity under the Wetlands Protection Act. I second that. Oh, and I would like a silver star, please. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Just to reiterate, this is for 30 Village Place. Yes. 30 Pally, Paley? Oh, Village Place. 30 Paley Village Place. The jury is still out on the pronunciation. We're trying to figure really? that out. I mean, it's Pally. So I'm just going to... Pally? All right. Pally. Yeah, like I said, we're going to be late for supper. You live there, so we'll go with yours. Okay. Um, so looking for a vote on this one. Laura? Aye. Anna? Aye. Larry? Aye. Jen? Aye. Leroy? Aye. And I for me as well. So John, thank you very much and you are good to go and any paperwork will be coming your way from Aaron. Right, thank you all very much and have a good rest of the night. Okay, so let's keep on trucking here. Okay, so that was our 740, so we are moving on to our 745. This public meeting is now in order. This meeting is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth and Act relative to the protections of wetlands as most recently amended in the Town of Amherst Wetlands Protection Bylaw. This is a request for termination for Margaret Nully, the owner for reconstruction of an existing barn and 24 foot by 20 foot shed addition. The chicken coop will also be relocated to the west end of the addition of the shed addition. All work is proposed to be over 40 feet from the bordering vegetated wetland at 657 South Pleasant Street. So, Margaret, I see you and I am promoting you to panelist. And seems like it takes Can you second. hear me? We can. Can you see me? We can. Wonderful. Here, let me get my step back. Um, I am Margaret Nunnally, and um, I'm, I'm ready to give you my spiel. We are ready for your spiel. spiel okay. Um, I own and reside at 657 South Pleasant Street, and out there in the ether someplace, I think my husband John is also here, um, and we are proposing a barn renovation, and um, I see the um, uh, drawing from our application is on the screen, which is excellent. We submitted our application on September 2nd, and um, it shows the rebuilding of an existing barn to kind of improve the efficiency of our garage space and to convert some of the barn into guest accommodations. Uh, the drawing also shows the addition of a 20 by 24 foot storage shed on the west side of the barn. Our property is across the street from the Fort River and our property also has wetlands. Uh, the river high water delineation in the wetlands were flagged on July 13th by Ward Smith of Wendell Wetland Service and the flags were surveyed by Eaton Associates on July 13th. And um, the, uh, the drawings from that survey are marked on the, the drawing. All construction for our project is further than 50 feet from the wetland and all construction work can remain further than 50 feet from the wetland. The entire barn is outside the 200 foot Fort River high water line. Um, during her site visit yesterday, Erin and I discussed the, the placement of a sediment barrier 
and it too will be um, beyond that 50 foot line. And um, yeah, and that's, that's at that place, that's all lawn and grass filtery stuff there. So that's our application as it's written, and I'll pause for you to talk and discuss, but there are two other issues that have come up since our application. So I don't know if you'd like me to address that now or kind of get through the application first and then put the caveats on. Uh, if they're relevant to the application, please go ahead now. Okay. Um, so during the process of construction, we might have to do two temporary things. You can see um, in the photograph that's in the upper right, that's our chicken coop in our little chicken yard. We have a very small flock, um, but we're hoping to pick up that chicken coop and move it to the west side of our farm road that you can see in the photograph and on the drawing. And that would be right about at that 50 foot, um, yes, Aaron, just drew a little circle where we're talking about temporarily putting that during the construction itself. Mm -hmm. The other temporary thing that we might have to do is get a storage pod that we would put, yeah, probably there, maybe between the two trees that are drawn there. Yeah. And um, again, we're not even sure we need that storage pod, but that's, that's it. So two temporary things during construction. And the other issue is we've been working with our architect and our building, uh, our builder on all of our plans. And we are kind of prepared to do this within the exact existing footprint of our existing barn. But we, we really would like to go two more feet to the south. So the south side of the barn at the bottom of the drawing there, um, moving it two feet further to the south um, and giving us some additional space just for structural reasons on the inside. Mm -hmm. So those are my two caveats that were not on the application. Okay, and so that extra two feet is not on the plan at this point, correct? Correct. Okay. Okay, um, so Erin. Sorry, can I just ask one question? So um, is that if it extends two more feet to the south, is it then inside the 200 foot Fort River yeah. buffer? No, because you can, you can see the arc of the 200. Yep. So it, I don't, I just don't know the scale. So it wouldn't be, it still wouldn't be within 200 feet. Correct. Okay, thanks. Yes, so um, this was one of those that was kind of on the cusp as far as being, um, you know, because she's doing a shed addition and it's chicken coop and they're over 50 feet away. Um, at the time the application came through, they weren't proposing any uh, modifications to the barn footprint. But I'm really glad at this point that we filed it with the state anyways. And so it's being reviewed under wetland protection and under the local bylaw. Um, from uh, visiting the site, the site's very flat. Um, there is, as you, if, if you're looking um, at the top right hand photo, looking, uh, there's a slight elevation um, increase as, as the farm road um, goes around that corner. So my recommendation was just to put um, erosion controls along the edge of that farm road until it gets past that, um, uh, I forget the, the uh, technical name for it. I always call it burning bush. Um, that, that bush right there. Oh, euonymus. You, winged euonymus. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> um, and then um, my recommendation is for the placement of the chicken coop and the chicken run that they do uh, temporary, well that they, that's only being placed temporarily, but that they also put an erosion control barrier around that um, w during construction if they're moving it and then relocating it to the new location that that site where the chicken coop is temporarily needs to be stabilized um, before that erosion control is taken up. Um, but 
but there was no um, vegetation removal really proposed as part of the plan. It's, it's kind of existing lawn or existing infrastructures kind of located um, in that area already. Um, so I didn't, I didn't really have any major concerns with, with what's being proposed. Um, I just would recommend that if for, for allowing the items that are not shown on the plan, um, that those items be conditioned in and also that, um, you know, we may want to request just a revised plan that shows those items, um, even if they're hand drawn in just where they're located and that there's erosion controls around them. Yeah, I like the idea of having those on a revised plan there. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so commissioners, again, fairly straightforward one, I think. Uh, any comments or questions? Uh, we still have two additional people from the public. They're probably here for something else, but if they have any comments or questions, now's the time. Not hearing any, looking for a motion. You can do it. Um, I move that we issue a positive determination, checking box B5 to acknowledge that the work is jurisdictional under the local wetlands bylaw and a negative determination under B3, um, the wetlands, Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act with the conditions that a revised plan Oh boy, is um, provided to the wetland administrator that shows um, the larger footprint of their proposed um, renovation, renovated structure, structure, and the temporary location of the chicken coop and um, potential storage pod um, during construction. Um, further conditions are that we recommend that erosion controls be installed at the limit of work. Um, erosion control should be installed around the chicken coop and the pod if we end up doing, if you end up doing a pod. Um, there should be a erosion control inspection by our wetlands administrator, administrator prior to the start of work. And once the site is stable prior to removing controls and our, the town of Amherst wetlands administrator has the right to monitor the site to, during construction to ensure compliance. Um, and this is all for reconstruction of an existing barn and a 24 foot by 20 foot shed addition um, in over 50 feet from the VBW, VBW at 657 South Pleasant Street in Amherst, Mass. Yes, I second that, Jen. Okay, looking for a vote. Leroy? Aye. Jen? Aye. Laura? Aye. Anna? Aye. Larry. Aye. And I from me as well. So thank you very much, Margaret. You are basically all said a couple of things and Aaron will be in touch in regards to paperwork. So thank you. Wonderful. Okay, bye-bye. Hey guys, I gotta go. I think I'm okay. just missing the last one, right? Bye, Jen. You'll be okay. <laughs> we'll somehow get through the motions. <laughs> Thanks, I'll see you guys in October. <laughs> Okay, just making sure the, okay, that looks updated. Okay, so we are moving on to our eight o'clock agenda item. This public meeting is now called to order. This meeting is being held as required by the provisions of chapter 131, section 40, the general laws of the Commonwealth and act relative to the protections of wetlands. As most recently amended in the town of Amherst wetlands protection bylaw, this is a request for determination, Kestrel Land Trust for removal of existing shed and steps, removal of dead trees, and creation of handicapped accessible entrance within 100 feet of pond. Also proposes a fire department turnaround within 200 feet of Plum Brook and within 100 feet of pond at 37 Bay Road. And so if you are here for this, if you could just raise your hand. Okay, Tom. Okay, Tom, so you should, let's, if we can unmute you here. Yep, 
Yeah, so Tom, can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Uh, there we go. Yeah. You are good at this point. And so Tom, if you could introduce yourself and give us a little bit of background, that'd be much appreciated. Sure. Hi, uh, my name is Tom Hartman, principal here at Coldman Hartman Architects in Amherst, uh, representing Kestrel Land Trust. Um, Kristen DeBoer, the executive director, is my wife. So um, this has to go well. <laughs> um, so uh, the, the land trust is changing the use of this property, which is currently a single family house at 37 Bay Road. It was acquired by the Epstein family a, a couple years ago. And as you may know, there was a deal done with the town of Amherst to put the pond and the dam into conservation. Okay. So this is the site um, that uh, resulted from that acquisition. There's 200 feet of frontage, um, a long driveway that comes up and we determined, my office determined this boundary from the survey that was prepared by ISER, which showed the boundary of the pond the culvert location and Plum Brook um, we put together from GIS. So of note is that this change of use to a business use is permitted by right through site plan review. So I need to go to the planning board. There's some demolition on a building over 50 feet. I have to go to the historic commission. And then as you can see, some of the work that we're doing is within the boundaries within hundred feet of the pond and 200 feet of Plum Brook. So, um, Aaron was out with me yesterday and we looked at, at the particular situation where there's a shed which is probably 30 or 40 feet from the pond, which is in bad shape to be removed. There are steps that go from the house down to the pond that are a hazard that frankly should be rebuilt with handrails, but we're proposing to remove them entirely um, and then place uh, wood chips, which were going to come from some of the trees being removed to make an unpaved walkable path down to the pond. Um, we al also may uh, put in the future a, an additional path that comes down around on the gentler slope around um, the site. And the steps may be rebuilt in the future as well. Um, but as you can imagine, um, we have some constrained budgets and are deciding what we need to spend uh, the available funding on, but we're getting all the permitting set up to do that. Um, there are several dead trees around the house on the south side of the house. I think six or seven, some fairly large that are hazard trees, which are going to be removed. Um, and then working with the building commissioner and the fire department, I think it's important to know, um, and Aaron, if you could go back to that site plan real quick that when this building changes from a single family to a, a business use, NFPA 1 comes into jurisdiction, which is fire department access. It requires a 20 foot wide driveway to the building, given the length of this driveway. Um, we only have 14 feet at the moment. And so we've been able to negotiate with the fire department, the building commissioner, having a notified fire alarm as a compliance alternative because this would be a substantial amount of work um, to widen the driveway, given the grading that's there um, within 200 feet of the brook. And you know, it, it, it would be a substantial amount of work. So that's very, very helpful to have that compliance alternative. Um, additionally, the change of use requires an accessible entrance, which you can see is on that little curve there, which is gonna come in on the north side of the building, just barely within the 100 foot buffer of the pond. It's currently a Goshen walkway, which is going to be replaced um, with an asphalt impervious pathway. Um, but no, no significant change of area to that. And then additionally, outside the buffer, there are some parking areas that are being striped on existing paving, a couple of extra sheds that are coming down, and the potential to remove the garage in the future. But that's, again, outside your jurisdiction. Um, any questions? Erin, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, so um, the photo all the way to the left is the um, the dam uh, that goes that um, uh, contains the pond, and then Plum Brook actually exits out of the dam there. So this is the area where the um, 
uh, fire department turnaround would be placed and my understanding is that's going to be gravel. There are a couple trees um, that are needing to come down. They were flagged um, in this general area just to allow the turning radius of the um, of the, the fire truck. Um, this is a the photo to the right is the Goshen Stone walkway that they're replacing and making handicap accessible. And then there's a fence that runs along that Goshen Stone. And there's a better picture of it all the way to the left here from what I understand that fence is coming out. These are the photos of some of the hazard trees. There's a lot of large oaks that hang over the house that are completely dead. Um, that they're proposing to remove and use reuse some of the wood chips on site. These are the this is a photo of the staircase that's got to come out and I had just recommended when they pull the logs that they spread wood chips from the cut trees in this area to stabilize it. Um, this is the the shed that's closer closest to the water that needs to come out that's within our jurisdiction and then there's a a small garden area that's also coming out and that's on the plateau beside the pond. Okay, sounds good. So commissioners, thoughts, ideas, questions? No, I mean, overall, it seems like some nice improvements. Okay. Um, so betterment as far as you know, mm -hmm. wetlands are concerned, so that's all great. Yeah, and well thought out. No, I, no concerns for me. Can I bring up one more thing? Mm -hmm. On my way up here um, after dinner, uh, I was asked to, to make one more request, which I just remembered. As Plum Brook enters the pond, there's a path that comes from the house that connects to the trail system, and it's currently very, very muddy, even in, in, a, in a drought that we're in now. And the question is, do we need to work with you to permit little bog boards to go across that muddy section, basically some logs from the site with some planks? Um, should we include that in this or is that something we can, we can do? Yeah, I mean, I think we can just condition that in and we should be fine. Okay, thank you. So I'm not quite sure, you held up a card, but I couldn't read it, so I'm not sure what that was. That was a little sketch. Oh, okay. gotcha, oh, okay. <laughs> As a, that's a, that's my reminder. <laughs> so um, DEP has a funky policy about bog bridging. Um, DEP Western Region considers footing for bog bridging to be fill in wetlands. So I would just recommend that the board um, condition that the footings for the bog bridging should not be located in in a wetland. Um, if you know, if at all avoidable, they should be. Um, they should be spanning the wetland so that um, they're not, you're not putting fill in the wetland. And also it should be as elevated as possible up off the ground to allow light to get underneath it. And when you say footing, I mean, all I'm talking about is a couple of logs. I understand. Okay. It's, I, I mean, I've seen, I've, I've permitted throughout the state and never, never seen or heard of such a policy on bog bridging, but um just kind of some recommendations based on DEP, dealing with DEP Western Region on this issue. I think we'd come back to you then, given what I just heard. So could I chime in, Brett? Please. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I wanted to start um, by saying just um, in the area near the dam, the turnaround area, um, one of the things that um, Tom may or may not be aware, but I did speak with Kestrel Trust about potentially getting a, an easement to access that area, an easement over the driveway, because I'm not sure we legally have the right to pass and repass over the driveway to get to the dam. So that might be something, Tom, just to... Um, I actually forgot to mention it to Kristen, but it might be good to take that back to her. Right. Um, I just want to make sure that that turnaround doesn't in any way interfere with access to the dam and, you know, that there wouldn't be any, um, um, any significant elevation change there so that a, 
I don't know, an emergency vehicle couldn't get over the dam, uh, um, you know, an ATV, if there was an issue with the dam or, or uh, some sort of uh, health or EMS situation uh, up there? Yes, the, there will be nothing blocking um, someone going past the turnaround onto the dam. There'll be signage that says fire department turnaround, no parking. Mm -hmm. um, the turnaround will be plowed along with the driveway as well. Um, and so you, it's essentially placing trap rock gravel on the existing grading that's there just so that it doesn't get dug up so much. Sure, um, that, that sounds great. And we can, you know, we can talk, um, I can talk with Kristen about the, uh, the easement issue. I'd raised that with um, the, um, with her former staff person, um, Paul Gagnon. Mm -hmm. um, I did just want to comment on the trail issue and I, I, I'm a little bit, honestly, I'm a little bit challenged by that. I'm not sure how the commission can make a ruling on that if there hasn't been a delineation. Right. Well, let's just put that on the table and we'll come back if we yeah. want to do something. I think that would, you know, we, um, the department um, comes before the commission whenever we're permitting new, new bridging of any kind. So it would seem from a consistency standpoint that if Kestrel wanted to come back, which I, I know exactly where that area is because I worked on this project with, with Kristen and staff at Kestrel, but it would seem to me the logical thing would be to come back with a, a separate filing for that trail work. Agreed. Okay. So we will not add that to what we're talking about here. So thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay, we have nobody left from the public, so. Um, so that means we are looking for a motion. Okay, I'll try it. Um, I'm moving to recommend a positive determination, box, box B5, that acknowledges that the work is jurisdictional under the local wetlands bylaw. 37 Bay Road and a negative determination under B2 and 3 of the, under the Wetlands Protection Act with conditions. Uh, these conditions are that all disturbed areas must be stabilized with mulch, straw and seed or wood chips or stone uh, to notify the wetlands administrator at the start of work and when it was complete to notify the wetlands administrator well no to acknowledge that the wetland administrator has the right to monitor the site to ensure compliance and that any changes to the plan in jurisdictional era, areas require the board's approval. There was one additional condition, what was that, that we just verbally discussed? Uh, we were talking about bog bridging, but we rescinded that. Okay, great. Um, uh, and this is all for 37 Bay Road. Second. Second. Ha ha, I beat you. Okay, looking for a vote, Leroy? Aye. Larry? Aye. Laura? Aye. Anna? Aye. And aye for me as well. So thank you, Tom. Aaron will be in touch. Thank you all. Have a great evening. You too. Okay. So at this point, we are through our agenda. Uh, Aaron, are there any other nuggets that are sitting out there waiting for us, or are we done? Oh, um, the only thing I'll just mention as far as monitoring reports is we've been having some problems receiving um, Applewood monitoring reports from Alan Weiss, so I've requested that he start sending them hard copy. He's He's been sending them um, electronically and they've been going to my spam box, I think, um, not being delivered. And so anyways, that's the only that's the only other thing regarding monitoring reports. I think we've covered all other business. Excellent. So with that, looking for a motion for adjournment. I move. Yes. Second. Second. Okay, so <laughs> Third. Anna? Aye. Aye. Oh, we heard an aye from Larry already. Laura? Aye. Leroy? Aye. And aye as well. So we are done. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Have a good night. Thank you, guys. Actually, thank you to Aaron. So great as always. Yeah, thank Thanks, Aaron. Aaron. Be safe and have a good weekend. And Aaron, I'll yes. stop the recording at this point. Thank you.